reason that the the investigation is constantly false recommendation for those false effects. Hi everyone, I'm Johan and I'm from Sri Lanka. Hi everyone, my name is Nitish Nagesh and I'm from India. India. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Michelle. Hi, my name is Michelle. Uh, I'm from Malaysia. I work for the Women's Forum for the Youth Action Track, and I'm uh, very happy uh, to see all of you today. My name is Jessica. I'm from the Youth Action Track, and I'm from the San Francisco company. My name is Ramona, and I'm uh, Jocelyn Balasa from the Permanent Representation of the Philippines here in Rome. So I'm the Deputy Permanent Representative and the Agriculture uh, Representative of the Philippines to Italy and the UK. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Juan David Carvalho Alvarez. I'm Focal Point for Latin America. Thanks. Hi to all, uh, my name is Nicola Duque. I am from Chile and I'm also part of the focal point group from Latin America and Caribbean. Hello, I'm Kamshin, I'm from Fiji and I'm also part of the focal group. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, and I'm Jim from the Philippines and I'm here to help out with the regional discussions on Asia Pacific. Okay, so we we have a Kickstarter that we got to know each other and just to go over the housekeeping rules to start off. Do we have uh, the slides coming on? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and so we want to go through the housekeeping rules uh, to the next slide, please. And uh, basically, this is a safe space for everyone here, the youth and of course, uh, all the participants uh, here in the discussion. And our discussions are based on inclusivity, diversity, and respect of all persons. Secondly, the use of inappropriate and insensitive language is strongly prohibited. And third, please be conscious of the time limit of the session. Try to be concise with interventions. That way, all the participants get a chance to speak. We'd love to hear all uh, inputs from as much people as we can. Okay, so with that, let's we'll start off with uh, the video that kind of a uh, encapsulates what we're doing and what we, we've done. So next slide, please. Okay, so basically this was uh, in, back in 2021 when we launched the World Food Farm, uh, we did a global youth action compendium and a team of us went through as many documents as possible to capture what were the kind of statements that were already out there 
manifestos, statements, commitments from governments, from uh, youth organizations, or even agriculture-related organizations, food-related and diets and all of these. We put them all together, and that's where we got the 17 uh, policy asks that, that we found in, in the compendium. And one from the survey, that we wanted to kind of like cross validate and uh, we got five policy asks. So from the compendium and from the survey, there were five, there were top five uh, policy asks or pr policy priorities that came out of it. And what we did was during the regional consultation, we went through the process of putting the 10 out there with everyone and then discussing which ones somehow were overlapping or were similar and we put them together and that brought us to five policy priorities. Now during the consultation, the process really kind of further elaborated on the kind of specific actions that go into each of the priority or how to better phrase the priority. And now what we want to do today is we're going to present the different priorities that came out of the consultation and then to get uh, everybody's input on the priorities and see how, how do we, is there a way to better phrase it? Is there a better to, way to input it? Or from your own experience as well, what kind of actions on the ground actually work best under these or with these kinds of policy priorities. And we also have here, of course, uh, from the Philippine representation, and we're hoping to see that uh, we can get an input on how policy uh, implementation, how policies can be probably adopted, implemented, or get also their feedback on that matter. And so now we wanna start off with the first policy priority. Is everybody good? Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to keep this as light as possible. Okay. This is not a stiff meeting. So don't be tense at all. Um, there's no, this is not going to be parliamentary uh, order or, or any of that sort. So we want to start off, and this is the first uh, policy priority. Next slide, please. And this is policy priority number one. Work with us on ensuring policies and innovations support, benefiting and providing social protection to smallholders, families, indigenous peoples, women, and youth. And what we agreed on on specific actions is provide social protection to farmers and access to the resources and optimization needed. Second is provide incentives and opportunities for young people to engage in every step of the agri-food system, such as agriculture and or entrepreneurship. The second one, so what I will, we'll do is basically just like the consultation, we'll go through the five and then we go back to one and then we discuss, yeah? So next slide, please. So policy priority number two is work with us on moving towards public policies and investments that are inclusive based on joint research multi-stakeholder dialogue, public engagement, addressing relevant ministries with a long-term perspective. And uh, the actions under which are seen here are incentivize environmentally and socially friendly practices, restore natural ecosystems, promote healthy and sustainable diets. Okay, so while you're listening to this, take down notes. If you have any ideas already coming in, uh, popping up in your head, please do it so. Policy priority number three. Uh, next slide, thank you. Work with us in prioritizing, improving, and strengthening sustainable domestic production based on local practices in order to fulfill the nutrition needs, food security of the population without the reliance on an interference of food imports. And this is by, by valuing, understanding, and utilizing indigenous traditional local food knowledge in food production, ensuring access to inclusive local markets and local distribution systems, bridging regional and global market opportunities. Okay, policy priority number four, work with us on investing in promoting the production, accessibility, consumption of safe, healthy, and sustainable food throughout the food system. And the actions, 
Number one, educate and provide capacity development to all in the food system to produce and consume safe and quality foods. Second, provide access to healthy and nutritious food options through procurement in civic and school areas. And third is to phase out harmful chemicals from farm to fork while promoting innovative approaches for sustainable agriculture. And fifth, left, next one, work with us in establishing inclusive, healthy, and sustainable feeding programs whilst mainstreaming scientifically robust food education in the national school curriculum. And this is uh, the action under which we see focus and educate on sustainable food consumption patterns, nutrition, better food habits, production in agriculture, and local foods. So with that, we'd like to start off with uh, the reaction and also inputs from our from our uh, from the Philippine representation. Um, okay, and she's requested to maybe get the inputs of everyone first, and then we get the policy makers uh, perspective policy perspective. Correct, Okay. All right. So we she wants to hear from the youth first. <laughs> Yeah, let's go priority by priority. Okay, and uh, thank you very much to our team. We we'll also do the note taking for this. So basically, what we want to look at is uh, per priority, the how, the what, the main barriers, and uh, also experiences on the field. Uh, if you have any, how does it look like on the field? with these kinds of priorities? Is it something that you've seen enacted into law? Is it something that you see there's a gap in, in in terms of implementing it or adopting? And what are the challenges if there are any? So let's start with policy priority number one. Ensuring policies and innovation support, benefiting providing social protection to smallholders, families, indigenous peoples, women, and youth. Um, you could easily raise your hands. We'll recognize and we'll take uh, you can take the floor. It's open for discussion. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, Jessica. Well, I just want to actually start off the conversation by saying that I am Chinese American, Asian American, and I have a Chinese heritage. So I'm ethnically Chinese, and I come from a farmer's uh, family, and my grandparents. They are actually, they were, uh, you know, in the farming environment and because of the revolution. And so they had to actually leave their hometown and be, be in the rural areas. And I actually grew up in the urban area. The reason why I want to actually share my story is because when we have the Asia and Pacific uh, regional world, I just want to say that when I actually went back to visit the, uh, the countryside in China, I noticed that there are a lot of youth that are actually not in the countryside anymore. Meaning that in the rural areas, there's actually a vacuum. And so why is that? The reason is because when the teenagers and also youth nowadays, they're more prone to move away from the countryside and also engage in urban city and city jobs. And if we want to actually motivate and incentivize the youth and the young adults to go back to engage in the agricultural farming productions and also in the agri-food systems productions, in the Asia-Pacific region, there must be more work that needs to be done in terms of coming up with more social protection for youth and also for financing to incentivize them so that they can have an equal or a greater benefit of even convincing them to come back to the countryside to farm and also to engage in the transformation of agri-food systems. And this is for the Asia Pacific region. And I wanna share this because no matter where I am in, cause I am based in the US right now, but because of my heritage, I see that there is a lot of similarity in terms of you know, what's happening in the Asia Pacific region, in terms of youth participation in agri food systems, and in, also in farm production. Also in Latin America too. I was in Mexico attending the youth delegation for CEC, one of the commissions uh, that was actually established in 1994. 
as a result of uh, the uh, trade agreement, the NAFTA trade agreement. And so they actually coordinate on the environmental side of the NAFTA, the trade agreement. I was part of the youth delegation. And I noticed that when I was in Yucatan, Merida, yeah, it's actually very similar to what's happening in Asia Pacific, meaning that there's a vacuum. And so there's not a lot of youth and you see a lot of empty houses and also empty farmland. And so this is what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, do we have any interventions? Please limit your interventions to one minute 30 as much as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, and I think we've had this conversation and I talked about with this as well. When I was reading this priority yesterday, when I look at social protection, my question was like, how can we have social protection in Malaysia and in our regions where, you know, it's such an informal sector where you base, don't even have sometimes unemployment uh, uh, benefits for our people. So how can we even talk about social protection for our farmers then when, you, and in the face of them also with the climate crisis and stuff like that, how can we protect them? And I think this is where I want to hear, I don't know, from experience or from other people, does it exist, um, this statement, this action? How can we really protect the farmers? Um, and we talked about it yesterday and we, we were discussing I saw also in the virtual consultations for, you know, climate, um, um, climate how do you call this? Insh exactly, weather-based index uh, insurances and stuff like that. But then the question came, how, where would you get the money for this insurance uh, for um this insurance is so open for discussion. Of course, there's also no one right way as well, but uh, we'd love to hear, uh, especially how we can have social protection for farmers. Thanks, Michelle. Very important points. Youth participation gap, uh, social protection. Any other? Yes, let me go with Dinesh and then Wayne. After Hello, that. everyone. My name is Dinesh Pande. Uh, I'm originally from Nepal. And uh, thank you, Jim and Michelle, for inviting this uh, discussion and i'm so sorry if i do not have much background on this uh, meeting and then the, we have been drafting all those policies and then we have been discussing today so when i'm reading this uh, first point is basically it hit in my mind that uh, who we are first and where we want to target you know when we want to toss the smallholders are those only smallholder farmers or like a family you know it is a huge storm right now and then it gives an uh, impression that where we want to focus. For example, is smallholder families, indigenous people, women and youth. My suggestion is it might be better where do we want to focus with the priority. So what do we want to address first? And then may maybe like a, if you read the supporting agenda two points, they may not, uh, they may not uh, address completely with our draft uh, version of the policy. So this is my suggestion only. So if we make a prioritize, that may make it easier for us. Thank you. Thanks. So just to recap a little bit, the red one is the policy priority and the green one are the suggested actions for the priority. So yeah, uh, basically just, just so that uh, for those who just came in, thank you. Wayne, you have the floor. Also. Uh, thank you, Jim. If I may respond to, I'm sorry, I missed your name, um, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. With regards to the term of social protection for smallholder farmers and indeed farmers all around the world, it's a very contentious one, as you say. How do your countries actually afford that? I think we need to start looking at social protection for people in the agriculture system in or food systems entirely differently. Agriculture is part of the problem towards climate change, but it's also part of the um, part of the solution through adaptive farming techniques, increase in biodiversity and sequestering carbon, governments and climate, uh, climate financing institutions start to need to look at how they start paying farmers for the ecosystem services they provide. Now that would create a social protection mechanism without governments actually having to come up with a framework for social protection. If we can recognize agriculture globally as part of the solution to this problem, then that in itself, with the amount of climate financing being put into developing countries, can be directed towards the agricultural sectors when they can prove they're providing ecosystem services back to the land and back to the soils. Thanks, Wayne. Any more in the room? Hi. Okay, fine. Yeah, okay, fine. None so far. Okay, I can get them. Yeah. Hi everyone. I wanted to ask if um, 
has anything has been done already? Uh, any project, any measure has been already implemented? And if so, it failed or succeed in order to understand what has already been tried and tested in order to understand it to have more, a bit more context in order to you know give more insightful inputs thank you so we have a in Fiji they just started working on a climate insurance policy and uh, post farmers specifically and essentially they pay one dollar per I'll week and every time the agriculture gets flooded they get money back for it but it's not been working very well First, because it's still in the preliminary stages. Next, because they have like specific criteria. They don't offer that service to all farmers. They offer, like they look at it themselves and they're like, okay, this area is flood prone anyway. So we're not gonna offer them anything. Like, like that's how it is. And then they look at like, okay, this area may not be like that flood prone. So there's a highly likelihood of like them not having to claim for insurance. So they offer it to those farmers. So I guess that's also a problem. Like where, so I guess that's why it fails. And like those people who need it can't buy it. Those people who don't need it can buy it, but they never have to claim for it. So essentially nobody's making money. Nobody's losing money, I think. Thanks, Kamsin. I'll take one more. Thank you. Uh, I want to mention again that I'm from Afghanistan and everyone uh, here know about my country situations. So my question is how can we provide social protections in Afghanistan that we like we have we know when what situation Afghanistan is right now. Sorry, okay. I'll take one last and then I'll hand over to the mayors. Good morning. Um, I am Musa Chow from the Gambia. Um, I'm representing a civil society organization in the Gambia called 4H. Um, I just want to ask a question. This is a very interesting presentation. Um, how is the WFF um, working with uh, young people in Africa? Okay. So we're in the, uh, sorry, uh, just to put it correction, this is the Asia region, uh, Asia Pacific Regional Roundtable. So we'll focus in on, on the Asia Pacific. Uh, we have the African in the later today. Yeah, and we can, thank you very much. But for, for that, you can also, we can also discuss that. No, we need to, no, no problem. You can stay. <laughs> um, at any rate, I'll hand over to um, Dr. Joy. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Jim, for the presentation. Um, I understand you did this consultations to get ideas on how the policy asks on how to transform food systems. And uh, you've given the, the points of view that it has to be made attractive so that, um, yeah, I, think I can just skip that there. No, It, it has to be attractive uh, so that uh, the youth and uh, everyone else would be interested in going into agriculture, uh, into going to this business of uh, food systems. So yes, uh, so, so social protection, we can think of it like... Um, um, as a short-term measure, especially when there are shocks uh, to farmers. Uh, but eventually what we want to do is to make it profitable so that we won't have to be uh, keeping on subsidizing uh, our farmers, our youth, right? Uh, as you know, um, I think it was Michelle who mentioned uh, this would take a lot of budgets, so it could not be sustainable if you just keep on subsidizing. So the long-term goal is to make um, agriculture uh, productive um, and the whole business around food systems to be productive. Um, and if I just can give an example, in no way comprehensive, but as an example, uh, we have our social welfare um, department uh, working with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, so our social welfare has allotted some budgets for a social protection system, which includes income support program, specifically for uh, I, this example is for fisher folk whose livelihoods have been negatively affected during periods of closed seasons, for example, uh, um, uh, declared by our Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, because you also want to have closed seasons to uh, have uh, your fish be able to um, regenerate. No? Um, so, but yeah, that, that's an example of a, a social protection that is uh, being uh, provided. And um, 
of working with the Department of Agriculture, say if you want to have uh, social feeding programs by the Social Welfare Department, it's working with the Department of Agriculture to also uh, purchase the produce of farmers and use it for the school feeding programs. So uh, just uh, some insights of what uh, the Philippines has, has been doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Choi. And um, with that, we, 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 do we have any other points? Yes, please, from the back. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Elaine Springay. I'm the Agroforestry Officer here in FAO. Um, also happened to work in Asia Pacific for a number of years, and I'll be popping in and out of these. Um, I think it's important to note that most organizations now deal with social protection in some form or another. I mean, this is a generally a mainstreamed uh, part of project development, often implemented imperfectly, but the policies are usually are usually there. Um, I know FAO in particular has social protection embedded into or should have social protection embedded in every pro project. I do like the question, though, of, you know, what has been done and what has worked, because when I see the statement work with us, and this is a call from youth to work with us, it suggests to me that youth have actually been addressing social protection in some capacity. And I think it would be important to be able to answer that question yourself. What has been done amongst youth to address their own social protection? Um, and how can this be scaled up or worked with others? So I would strongly recommend that if no one or if there aren't organ youth organizations who already have some idea of how they're addressing so social protection themselves, what these are, to share these as widely as possible and to better understand what what works and, and doesn't work because I think what is what I'm hearing right now is kind of a typical we want social protection and we want other people to address it for us. How can you do that? But when I see work with us, and I'm really happy to see that um, my conversations with Michelle have, have are reflected in this. But I think you guys need to start saying this is how we are addressing social protection for ourselves. This is how we're ensuring that we are, this is how we are attracting ourselves to the agriculture or agri-food sector. And this is what we've learned from the process. Start empowering yourselves to, to share this because otherwise we're gonna be stuck in status quo. Thank you very much, very strong points. And uh, go ahead, yes. Mike, check, Mike, Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit late. I had a ceremony at the Indigenous People's Tent. My name is Atama. I'm from Borneo. Um, Borneo has three young members, Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesia. I come from the Malaysia side. Very interestingly, colleagues, uh, yesterday when I introduced myself to the Director General, he said, hey, you're Indigenous from Malaysia. You're commercial. But I know what it means. It's because Malaysia has achieved uh, Tier 3 um, for the MDGs. It has achieved also SDGs uh, during its term. But when we talk about social, social uh, protection system, I just want to share with colleagues and co-chair, uh, this year, the UNDP um, offered um, the government, state governments of indigenous territories of Sabah, Sarawak, and Orang Asli um, an expression of interest. And one very interesting thing, the government of Malaysia, the UNDP and the Ministry of Finance had, um, had created portfolios in the uh, grant uh, proposal. And this is uh, financing to state government, but this, this is connected to your conversation today. So the first portfolio is a more comprehensive and effective social protection system. So this commercial indigenous people's country has this in mind through the government. But uh, what we are very concerned, um, especially coming from indigenous people's role and the, uh, the, the, the community that you have addressed there is very important, which is getting to Asia Pacific. The United Nations Environment Program announced in Bangkok this year that in their discussions, achieving SDGs for Asia Pacific will take until 2065. This is because of the lack of disaggregated data. 
let me register that. So because of this, um, my indigenous people's group in sub Malaysia is approaching the Ministry of Finance of Malaysia and NDP to request for a facility for us to use our traditional customary governance system. So just for information, um, Malaysia happens to be maybe the only nation in the world that has a standing native court similar to your high court, court of justice. It's a native court. And this is a very, very good system, but it's not been explored by um, supporting agencies. So we are thinking the best way to track data the smallholders families, particularly indigenous peoples, is through the native court system. It is a government administration. It is recognized by federal government. Um, and we, we are trying to invite um, for country program action to help us give a capacity development to over 2,576 villages throughout Sabah, Malaysia. So just imagine a center where you invite all the youths, uh, farmers, and everybody to come to a one center and in a period of three months to six months, get the data, get the data there. So you know who you are going to be protecting because there are layers of social protection needs. Women, children, indigenous peoples, but there are in Malaysia also migrants. There are also refugees. There are also stateless or undocumented, but indigenous peoples have already this facility that needs support. So co-chairs and uh, colleagues here, can we register our voice because we are in the we are in the process of speaking to UNDP Malaysia to support us in our program for action, and we have the capacity and resources. What we're going to do? We're going to build a app to help the local government. So this is called the flash, the flash technology, where all the local government from the fisheries to the water and all this will have a training. We'll give them a training for one year, and after that, activate all districts throughout Sabah and then export it to Sarawak. So in the period, in the period of two years, we will have this aggregated data, especially on social protection for indigenous peoples and local communities. Thank you very much for this time for sharing with you. Thank you very much for sharing that. I think that's a very crucial uh, point as well uh, on, on data being one of the basis. How do we provide social protection when we don't have clear data on who to protect and what aspects to protect of these uh, communities? And I think that's a very clear point. Wow, so that, that's a lot for uh, priority number one. We, we, we've seen a lot of different aspects and I really understand the, the, the aspect of understanding and looking for what young people are actually doing. And I feel like if there are cases like that, that, those are the kinds of like cases that we need to put out there as well so that we can get policies and budgets in place to support and enhance those kinds of programs. I think that's very crucial. So I hope the notes was, that was also taken into the notes as well. All right, any more for policy priority number one? We have four more and I'm conscious of time. We have 45 minutes left. So I wanna allocate as much time also to discuss the other priorities as well. Is this for prior priority number one? Okay, please uh, keep it to one minute 30 if possible.
Thanks very much. Um, I think we'd, we'd appreciate also like a link to that later for, for the note takers, if you could give us so that we could reference it and see how that could uh, go into the discussions as there are at least in the document. Thank you very much. All right, so let's head on to policy priority number two. Everybody go with that. Can I see a thumbs up? And I'm used to the Zoom. You're looking for a thumbs up on, on Zoom. So now oh, we see real thumbs up. Okay, let's go to part. Policy priority number two. All right. Again, so work with us on moving towards public policies and investments that are inclusive based on joint research, multi-stakeholder dialogue, and public engagement, addressing relevant ministries with a long-term perspective. So this is more really on linkages. How does this look like? Floor is open. Okay. I'll go ahead with this side. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Nitish Nagish. I'm from India, specifically I'm from Bangalore, the south of India. And currently I'm uh, doing my PhD at the University of California, Irvine in the United States. I'm doing my PhD in computer science. And um, even though this topic is about public policies and investments, technology plays a very, very important role in bringing together different stakeholders. Specifically, I want to tell you a short story. During the pandemic, before the pandemic rather, I was working on uh, connecting multiple devices and improving efficiency of devices. And then when I saw that the world hit the, was really suffering, I wanted to do something more meaningful. So that's when I decided to switch my field and work on food recommendation systems, where I wanted to help people achieve their health and lifestyle goals through healthy and sustainable diets with the use of technology. So, for example, when I am in California, in Irvine, maybe I want to eat a specific kind of food and I open Google Maps and think, okay, restaurants near me, and it populates a list of restaurants based on cuisine, price, and so on. But then there is no filter or feature that allows us to filter our priorities based on whatever is good for us, whatever is healthy for us, and whatever is tasty for us, and whatever fits our dietary requirements. Same thing happened to me when I came here to Rome. It was very, very hard. So what I'm trying to do is build a system that will allow you to personalize rec food recommendations, especially in restaurants outside, that will give you food recommendations that is healthy, tasty, and meets your dietary needs. And in this way, what happens is you're also helping solve your dietary needs, but also promoting a healthy and sustainable diet across different populations and across different sectors. And there is a need for investment in this field, investment for research and development, and investment in collecting multiple data sources and involving multiple stakeholders to get the system up and running. Those are my two cents. Thanks, Jim. And it's so nice to see everyone in person and, and meet the faces behind the Zoom screens. Um, I wanted to look at this particular wording from a dietetics perspective. So my background is a, as a dietitian, um, but I do work in food systems and sustainable, um, sustainable diets and food production now. Um, I guess what I want to make sure that we highlight with number two, four and five, which all have to do with nutrition, um, is that when we're talking about public policies and investments that are inclusive, when we're talking about partnerships, we have to be really careful, particularly when it comes from a nutrition perspective, that we're engaging with stakeholders in the right manner. And what I mean by that is, for example, in the development of dietary guidelines, if we have stakeholders that are for, for example, um, from large agri-food businesses that rep represent perhaps ultra processed foods or foods that are actually not nutritionally beneficial, they can skew the dialogue to have corporate benefit rather than benefit for people. And so it's super important that we work with industry because they are the ones that produce our food. It's impossible not to. 
Um, but we have to be incredibly considerate and careful about the way that we do that, particularly when we're creating these kind of like pie in the sky or goals for our food system. So I guess when we have this particular one, I think it's really important that when we talk about multi-stakeholder dialogues, joint research, what do we mean by that? And what role does industry have? And in what positions do they have that role? So um, are we going to clarify this to make sure that perhaps there are some places where industry is, is um, particularly food companies that are producing unhealthy foods are perhaps sanctioned and, and not allowed? And where are we working with them? Because both is important, but we have to be really careful in the manner in which we do that. Um, thanks. I think along with that is also the the opportunity for us here to rephrase this. If you, if we, how do we do we want to narrow it down? Do we want to provide specific aspects of it or all that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, actually, um, as you saw just now, there was a QR code on the page. So actually, we do have a Google Doc open now. So if you're on your computer, actually, if you can, uh, sorry, if you can go to the last slide with the QR code. And if you want to scan it, we can also directly add your inputs uh, there as well. And here it's like really great discussion as well on, you know, different perspectives of how we have to bring it in. And also knowing and understanding that, you know, with 30 minutes left, this is not enough time. Uh, but we're here actually for the whole week, you know, and today we have a full day to continue discussing. But I think this is a really good starting point uh, in the discussion. But I just wanted to say, like, let's carry the, for the conversation forward as well and not feel rushed in this moment. And it's good to just share those examples and to continue it. Uh, as well. So here's the QR code also for people on AirMeet, please, um, and online, please do go uh, to the Google page and let's um, write our inputs all together in there as well. So thank you. Suggesting um, that's in a suggestion um, mode with the document, right? For them to put their inputs in. Yeah. So go ahead and scan the QR code and then you could also continue throughout the week putting your ideas in. If you have any, if you encounter people um thank you very much and i think that's a very good point uh, we, we we think about the when we talk about multi-stakeholder dialogue we want to see how equal the voice is as well yeah and i think it's very crucial yeah go ahead oh uh, yeah uh it's to support you um in uh, so in asia pacific for es members we engage a lot into like making sure that knowledge is shared and so that there is an uh, equal uh like our uh, Asian Pacific members that are in university, so they have knowledge, they can engage more with people that do not have the chance of going to university and to make sure that they do share their knowledge with people. And for instance, I had a very nice uh, meeting with um, some people that created a bracelet where you could share, uh, see uh, for people that were uh, breastfeeding, how your nutrition, what types of food you needed. And that way it creates like better nutrition for them. And they don't necessarily need to understand everything of the complex uh, food diet. So definitely improving the connection between universities, uh, students and local members are quite important as well. Thank you very much for that. Very good points. I think, um, you know, what was also raised a while ago uh, with a colleague, who, was, who went out already was that there are a lot of models already with this kind of, um, this statement in general, um, when you talk about joint research, multi-stakeholder dialogue, and we just had the food system summit, which was a really huge, huge, huge multi-stakeholder dialogue. I think the real question is, what are the kinds of models on the ground that we wanna further enhance? And I think that's this, that those are the kinds of models that we wanna capture and we wanna see how do we scale those up? How do we enhance them? How do we improve on them so that it reaches the kind of uh, targets and goals that we really want? So hopefully that's also something that goes into the document that we want to do is to find out and, and document these models. So what, that's what we're really hoping to see, uh, what we can do and what we can get policy to support. Yeah, I saw some. Yeah, I saw Jessica. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the great discussion here. And for the people in the two, I would like to actually discuss on climate finance and on financing, especially on non-concessional loans and concessional loans, especially in the Asia Pacific area, when a lot of the countries are actually underdeveloped or still developing. There is a need and it is a must to invest multilaterally 
internationally on these countries on helping them to adapt climate resilient and community increase the community response to natural hazards so that they can well prepare for the impacts that would be caused by the natural hazards and also safeguarding the well-being of their families, loved ones, and also the environment, and also the animals. And on the Paris Agreement 2.1c, there is a call to consistent flow of financing. And then here we are talking about blended financing models, which is why I would like to echo uh, Jim's point about what kind of models we can enhance on the ground. And that is one, having a risk-averse portfolio, if it is investments, and then also we need to have experts to help the developing and developed countries so that they can have multilateral support. For example, the MDBs. Thank you. Is that a document that's publicly available or is it, uh, or those are? So uh, this is actually not a document that's available, but we, World Free Forum does collaborate with a lot of the constituencies and also the organizations that work towards increasing climate finance ah, okay. and strengthening climate right. finance. So we can increase the partnership. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Michelle, go ahead. Oh, perfect. <laughs> but I had someone who wrote to me on the chat uh, for her input. She said like for this topic, um, it's you can argue that this is already perhaps done. Uh, it's in the process, it's happening. And you said with the UN Food System Summit and also IAS on how they're building capacity with youth to engage in the process. Um, but I think the question is here is like how we can improve the inclusivity on the ideas. Uh, how can we improve inclusivity in this with engagement of youth without being tokenized um, as well in this process? But I think when I read this text as well, is that I see that mostly it's on, you know, how the different ministries are kind of um, not in a collaborated uh, or like there's a lot of loopholes between like for example agriculture and health and I'm not forgetting about education and ministries and sometimes when you approach those as well it becomes oh but it's not my it's not my responsibility or it's not my topic so it's like also how can we foster that collaboration between the different ministries I think also to make sure that it is inclusive and we bridge those loopholes as well otherwise we are always in this constant um gray zone where people can do some stuff that should not have been done you know so right okay thank you very much for that timer as well well much appreciated um we have a very rich discussion and uh let's move on to policy priority number three and so this one looks at working on uh, prioritizing improving and strengthening sustainable domestic production based on local practices in order to fulfill the nutrition needs food security of the population without the reliance on interference of food imports. And I think if you notice the discussion, or at least just to give you a preface of what really took place or, uh, in the regional consultation was this was more based on the uh, impact of the pandemic, yeah? And we see lots of countries lock up, the, you know, the logistics and all these things. And even at the sub-national level, you see cities not having access to food because of all these logistical transports. And these are the kinds of shocks that we see that this kind of policy priority wants to address. So with that as a context as well, um, floor is open for discussions. And uh, do we have any hands raised? So sustainable production, um, nutrition sensitive agriculture i'll go ahead with uh, the lady here yes go ahead please um so i think this is um in order for something to be sustainable i think there needs to be some benefits to the farmers as well um in our country that's actually being done uh, really well by the agricultural banks um I know that Korea has an agri agricultural bank, um, but because I'm representing Phil um, Philippine service learning here, um, Philippines actually does not have an agricultural bank in which, um, so I think the important part here is that the agricultural bank allows the farmers to um, actually ensure that they, the produces from the farmers can be bought by the consumers. And there's that really clear link that 
the agricultural bank does. So I think that's a really important thing that every country should have. You think of it. Yeah, maybe just a point of clarification is that there is also an agricultural bank, uh, land bank of the Philippines, and also the development bank of the Philippines that works closely with the farming industries. I think the models could be different in terms of implementation, but definitely I think there are some similar similarities in how they implement that bank. But yeah, definitely that's also a model that could be taken into consideration is that um, when we talk about sustainable production, it also has to have a benefit for farmers as well. I see you, but we have Dr. Joy. Yes, and uh, when we say um, agriculture banks or land banks, like uh, Jim was saying, this can uh, give loans to farmers. And But I don't know if you were referring to uh, like uh, a space where farmers produce would be bought. No, 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 that's not the one you're referring to. So yeah, so we, we have our own uh, rural banks uh, assisting our farmers uh, through loans um, um, and um, also to, to help them have access also to, to markets. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to uh, uh, support this uh, item um, by um, mentioning that the um, Director General yesterday invited Indigenous peoples to collaborate and create a local wisdom bank. So in order for this to happen, um, a very, very strong engagement with Indigenous peoples um, would be a must. Um, he said in his uh, conversation around the fire yesterday, um, that he has um, deep knowledge about uh, ancestors and humanities, and he's counting on indigenous people to deposit their traditional knowledge and local wisdom in, into a, a, a bank. So let's just say, um, if this were to happen, um, what, are, what are then um, the conversations that we have to bring forward uh, in prioritizing improving as, as you mentioned here? Because when you talk about local food knowledge in food production, it is the, the daily uh, production and consumption for the indigenous uh, peoples. But when we look at food security of the population, for example, what, what are the, the connections here? How can technology come in? We are very interested to talk to you. Um, it, I, I think the conversation has already kicked off. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's find a way. What and, and, and how can we advance this? Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. It's a question for the panel because so I'm French. And so we do have some labels to protect a traditional way of doing like cheese, uh, doing some wine. And so I wanted to know if in your country, that could be something that you could do to have a label on some techniques, on some uh, religious or indigenous type of food that could help protect you economically and also to brand your, your, your nationality, your, your specifics. Uh, way of doing food? That's a question. I don't know if it's uh, something that is doable in your region. Yeah, that's, I think um, that's open for everyone. And I think that's also taken into the notes as well. Yes, go ahead, Wayne. Thanks, Jim. I can just personally say a slight paradox in the wording you have up here. Um, you know, you reference without the reliance on or interference of food imports, but then down the bottom, we have ensuring access to inclusive local markets and local distribution systems, bridging regional and global market opportunities. Um, I think it might not be the best idea to vilify uh, food imports or international trade. You know, the UN Population Division predicts that by the year 2100, there are going to be cities in Africa with 100 million people. 100 million people in a city can't be fed uh, can't be fed purely by local markets around the city you know we are going to need every tool in the toolbox and i think the wording of that could become a little bit contentious once this starts to form into actual policy recommendations down the track any advice on how to possibly phrase it better <laughs> um i would suggestion. say based on strengthening local and best practices and then reducing the reliance on food imports. The word interference, I understand it. I can empathise with that. Um, however, some countries, I imagine, during a policy negotiation would have some issue with that. Well noted, Wayne. Thank you very much.
Yes, go ahead, Kim. I just wanted to say that I agree. I think that that wording is really, really good and that clears up that um, contradiction. Yeah. Perfect. That's the, those are the kind of inputs that we need to, to, to actually polish this up as well. Thank you very much um, for pointing that out. All right, any more ideas on the floor? Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to say, um, like yesterday, it was mentioned in the opening ceremony how climate change is affecting the how fertile the soil is and the fertile areas and areas that used to be fertile are no longer fertile because the climate, it, everything's getting warmer, temperatures are changing, and that would also affect domestic production. And I just think it's very important to take into consideration that here as you are helping the agri food systems, but it's also important to let them know like they have some sort of security if this affects their production and it affects the workers and what they're doing there also needs to be taken into consideration how they can be affected either by flooding or by um, the temperature change and how they can be helped out if all the work that they've done in a couple of years is not useful anymore because of the climate change and just adjusting policies and taking that into consideration and how these people can have some sort of protection and know that they will be included even in the future. Yes, yes, Bob. Okay, yes, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, and the, on, on the climate issue, yeah, the Philippines said that's a very important issue to us as well. And you mentioned climate finance. So just to share the legislation that uh, we had, it's a Climate Change Act of 2009. Um, this legislation requires the mainstreaming of climate change uh, in policy formulation so that climate change policies and actions are incorporated into development planning and sectoral uh, decision making. Uh, so, you, so, you, so you can look, at, look up that legislation, but it also includes, uh, um, for example, uh, an initiative of the Climate Change Commission. It's an access to the People Survival Fund. So um, there are climate change adaptation projects worth about um, 310 million, which have been approved for delivery in the provinces under the People Survival Fund. We also have this initiative called the Adaptation and Mitigation Initiative in Agriculture. And uh, we also have crop insurance protection. This is some examples. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, last one, and then we move on. I just want to say it would be interesting to know, like ask the panel if that similar um, legislations are made in, in other countries, and if they aren't, how can they be implemented into these policies and how can that be added as a more of a regional thing? Thanks. Yes, Michelle. Yeah, I just like, I guess from the discussion that also the suggestion that was made uh, by Florence as well, like in Europe that you do see the certification of like when something is produced in a traditional way and stuff like that, maybe this is a good point of how we can maybe do it in our region, in Asia and the Pacific as well. Um, I don't know what you think uh, about that. Is that possible? But I know that in Malaysia, there's already a lot of conversation about how there's too much certification and how much money goes into certification as well. So that's also another issue of like uh, getting it to the right people uh, as well. But I think to touch upon uh, the other part about like the reliance and interference of and strengthening the domestic production and access to local markets, right? Because if you look at rural areas in Malaysia where they're producing, you know, all these all these products and commodities, the issue is the lands or no, the issue is the roads on connecting them to urban areas. And also when we talk about food imports and stuff like that, it's, it's that you see that it's ultra processed foods that are available in the rural areas because that's in the local small markets there because that's what's easy and has a long shelf life in this area so that's also an aspect there because locally you know a village can produce the food but it takes three hours to get to the main hub and then instead of that happening um, you have instead food imports in this area so i think this is also the part of this priority as well um, but would love to hear you know like if you know certification uh, happens because in Europe, I think they do it very well here and talking, talking about, you know, ancient grains that are used um, in the pastas and stuff like that. So that's maybe a way that we can try to further develop. I think to respond to my Malaysian colleague. Um, yeah. So I think this goes along with what the director general was saying, right? Um, rec recognize the traditional knowledge first, then you have access into the communities. Then you have the data on how long 
does a particular fish, if fermented in traditional igorot recipe, can last, and whether it is scalable to how Canada exports their salmon in 7-Eleven, which has a shelf life of, say, three months to six months. But how do we know that if it's a traditional recipe, if we don't identify it first? And who is best to qualify, right? Is it the uh, national board? It should be the customary traditional system board. And this is where we can work on that. But in today, like you said, my colleague, it takes three hours to get to the district, but the district officer also uses WhatsApp. So is there a technology for them to be connected, working very fast? So I think the solution comes when you uh, have a timeline based on the target for you to achieve it and for you to report it. Then there's work in progress next. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time. Is this policy priority number three? very quick before i go to policy priority uh -huh. number four <laughs> i think one of the things we want to talk about is also what like hinders our ability to implement implement these things so i think one of the things that cause issues in domestic production is accessibility to land um for example a lot of asian pacific countries people don't have access to land for example in fiji 86 percent of the land belongs to the natives and natives don't like farming so other people don't have access to land to farm. So that's why it increases exports, I mean imports, which means unhealthy living. Good point. Thank you very much. Access to land is also crucial. So access to resources in general. Um, all right, I will wrap up policy priority number three and move on to policy priority number four, which is on investing and promoting the production accessibility and consumption of safe, healthy and sustainable food throughout the food system. So basically this is uh, the suggested actions that were that came out of the consultations is capacity development, access to healthy and nutritious food options and phasing out of harmful chemicals from farm to farm. So the floor is open for discussion on this aspect. Yeah. Yesterday, I was speaking to one of the representatives who was building a system for of an atlas for young children to learn more about healthy diets, healthy planet. And from my survey on the different types of atlases currently in the US, in India, and in different parts of the world, all these atlases are printed in the form of a book and they are very static. Our environment is changing so quickly, and there is a need to build dynamic food atlases. So the food atlas should be updated on a real-time basis, just like how the atlas for, for example, population and energy density by the UNDP is existing. So for this purpose, there is a need for collecting food-related data sources from different local people. And it is like a call for action as, as youth and as tech-savvy people, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're building this open source database that will allow us to create a dynamic real-time food atlas that will help local people get access to resources, get access to information, and in this way, get access to nutrition that, that can help them make the right food choices and in turn, help the local community. Thank you very much. Dynamic tech. Follow up, sorry. What, what would this atlas encompass? Like, what would it look like? What would it have? The current idea for the World Food Atlas for food navigation, which is something we are trying to build, is collect, first of all, data sources, which are localized, for example, food related food supply information, supermarket information, ingredient availability information at the local level, and then integrate all these different sources in a huge database which has country specific filters for example one in india one in ethiopia one in malaysia right and then after all this data sources has been collected now there is a need for different stakeholders in the food ecosystem to also contribute to this for example the people who are supplying uh, grocery stores the the people who are the farmers the policymakers, right? And once all this information is collected in the centralized database, then the people who want to use, who have actually contributed 
to this uh, database can filter specific information. For example, say a policymaker in uh, um, Malaysia wants to download specific food items that have um, a shelf life of three years and has a specific country of origin. So in this way, this system will get crowdsourced information from the local stakeholders and this database can be leveraged not only by local people, but also people in the, at the highest level at the UNFAO and improves accessibility as well. Thank you, thank you. Very interesting uh, World Food Atlas, huh? Taken into consideration. Any more ideas on the floor? Yes. Um, uh, good day, everyone. So um, we are uh, representing the youth in the Philippines. And we would just like to share um, that we have a council specifically for the youth. We have um, a separate governance for the youth, which is called Sangguni Ang Kabataan. And we think that through the Sangguni Ang Kabataan, which is a council. So um, youth leaders are then elected uh, to be part of the Sangguni Ang Kabataan. And we think that it's also important for them since they are a council, they also implement programs, projects, and activities specifically for the Filipino youth. So we think that it's important for them to also prioritize uh, promoting agricultural programs for the youth, for them to be engaged. Because that's one thing that is lacking right now. The Sangguni Ang Kabataan um, doesn't really focus on agricultural systems anymore. They are more on um, focusing on um, the, uh, they call this uh, Liga or they have um, games to, uh, they allocate funds to play games, to, help, uh, to hold contests. But we think that it is lacking on um, what programs to provide for the youth, particularly in the agricultural sector. So we think that it's important to mobilize the youth. So um, in our case, in our country, it's through the Sangguni Ang Kabataan. And in that way, people are, um, uh, the youth are able to be tapped, to be part of, um, to be engaged in the agricultural sector. And um, we also think that in our country, there is a need to strengthen the linkages between the local government and national government agencies particularly, um, and by providing capacity development, we think that it's important to um, provide strong linkages with the uh, national departments, which is the Department of Ag Education, of course, Department of Agriculture, um, National Youth Commission as well, which handles the Youth Council, and including um, TESDA, which is a Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, um, through which they provide training for the young people. They should provide training for the young people. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, th those uh, having youth councils is a model to, to follow and also enhancing that. I think it's also crucial to, to point out uh, uh, 4-H as a partner in these kinds of approaches as it's a global movement and it's also very present even in our in our own country in the Philippines. Any more points to raise on capacity development, healthy nutritious food options, phasing out harmful chemicals? Yes, go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, so I guess like to build off on her as well on this topic of capacity development and engaging youth, but also looking at like, you know, the actions that were suggested here as well is that we also need to think about the trade-offs uh, in this as well, like phasing out harmful chemicals and farm to fork. It's not as easy as it seems, right? It has a lot of steps to go uh, after that as well. But how do we educate people to make the right policy discussion, uh, decisions and, and, and actions and priorities, which is also going back to the policy priority number two, I think, as well. Um, and this made me think of also that the, the food system uh, game that FAO is developing together with the lexicon, where it's using 190 countries' data to input there and use as a video game. You can try to select, okay, I want to do this policy priority. And then you can see the trade-offs and also how that affects different countries and different regions. So it's like innovations like this, perhaps, we can also build the capacity of young people to get engaged and understand, like, when we say, like, invest and promote these things, what exactly are the trade-offs there that's also very important to address um, as well. 
this may not be an academic uh, point, but it's like the movie Ender's Game, you know, it's like a very, you utilize game theory to kind of like get the young people to think in such a way that they're actually simulated in that manner. And so eventually when they go into the real thing, they know they know how to go through the, the decision making processes already when they're in that area so i think it's very crucial to also start off at that especially now with young people who are very we, you, we could say digital natives somehow or, or something like that that they know how to go navigate through video games okay so i think education embedded in game theory youth councils world food atlas alternatives and options and phasing out harmful chemicals those are things that we can consider any more and or uh, any last point for this before I move to priority number five. We only have 12 minutes left, so I want to be conscious of time as well. None. If none. I move on to the next one. All right. Let's go to policy priority number five. So the last one is work with us in establishing inclusive, healthy, and sustainable feeding programs whilst mainstream, uh, mainstreaming scientifically robust food education in the national school curriculum. Um, so basically looking at how we can revise and uh, enhance school curricula so that food education is already involved and mainstreamed into it. Any points, the floor is open. Any examples from country, from your own countries? Ah, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yes, as part of our Philippine Development Plan, um, we promote agribusiness courses and training programs, uh, even farm tourism enterprise development under collaborative schemes of the academe, the government, and business sector, and integrate agriculture, including the use of modern technologies, uh, drones, smart greenhouses, and smartphone applications in the elementary and high school curriculum to encourage um, uh, people to engage uh, in agriculture and fisheries. We think, uh, you know, you, it, you have to start early to have this appreciation for agriculture. Uh, so that, that's part of the efforts in, in the Philippines. And the, while I have the floor, yeah, the whole of government, whole of uh, society approach is really needed to have an appreciation and, and help transform uh, agri-food systems. I guess that has been mentioned uh, several times, but just to mention it again. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Sagar. now in all, all government schools of Nepal. So I think we can uh, include such uh, ideas in the uh, ideas as well. Thank you. Yes. From my yes. Um, so um, the Asia Pacific region of uh, EIS uh, often uh, try to bring um, uh, stranger universities like Wageningen or other university into uh, their national congress. So for instance, for Bangladesh, uh, they have been founded by Wageningen and the aim is to bring uh, maybe stranger and other uh, knowledge to uh, other people and to strengthen link between ministries, uh, uh, international uh, universities and also more local universities so that's an idea I guess if you can do that like trying to bring other universities into your university to bring knowledge and different knowledge and also of course uh, economic uh, and financial heads can be interesting thank you knowledge exchange and cross-pollination yep perfect yes Jessica yes thank you so much and I think one project or initiative that Wolf with One can do is to how to align the different tracks. So we have the Wolf Action Track, we have the Education Track, and we have Cultures, Young Scientist Group, how we can align all of these different tracks and be able to 
sustainably achieve PPA number five for the Asian and uh, Pacific region. One is to enhance the aquifer system education. So we have the ACE framework to enhance the six pillars of climate education, but we have yet to see one for aquifer system education. So all of our youth here today, we can actually think about how we can go forward of enhancing an aquifer system education curriculum for the grassroots levels. We don't, we don't have to get into the formal schooling yet, if that's uh, too much steps of going into you know, the approvals and then talking to the governments. We can start locally, grassroots level, and we welcome all of you to come and join us in the Winfield Forum as we move along with the implementation. So have ideas on that, and then we can follow up afterwards. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I mean, I just want to speak specifically to this um, policy priority ask because, I mean, the, the goal is to not leave anyone behind, right? But this is a national school curriculum. So probably might be best to also factor in um, for one out of school children and also non-former uh, academic setting to also ensure that the knowledge on sustainable food system and um, yeah, programs are getting to those that are not within the four walls of um, classrooms as well. Non-formal education and uh, vocational training, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, it was, I think like when I was uh, reading this policy, it was like the question of like, um, yeah, like making sure that what we are learning in schools um, is then related to also the food that's available in the cafeteria after, right? And maybe I wanted to just ask this question maybe to everyone else. It's like, do you have nutrition education in your school? And also do you have healthy food options in your school? Maybe just to see a raise of hands, uh, if you feel that this is um, yeah, met, uh, that you are learning about healthy food and also it's available in your schools. So we have like uh, a government has provided free feeding Government has provided free feeding services to uh, children or uh, below uh, class five, and uh, there is a concept of nutritious garden, which we call Posan Bagaisa in Nepali. So it means you grow all the nutritious food uh, you that you eat in, in the school garden. So it's a way of means uh, we are teaching uh, them uh, to grow various crops, fruits, especially vegetable and uh, fruits. And so, and also we are teaching them regarding uh, mushroom cultivation. So they grow these crops and that is integrated into their food. So that is provided in the, in the, in the lunch. So this is also a way so we can promote, I think. Great, yeah, school and home garden, school gardens and uh, enhanced by uh, food options that are available in line with nutrition education. <laughs> I think it's very crucial. Good. Uh, we have, we are down to four minutes for the session. And um, do we have any last uh, so comments? I'd like uh, to add further. Okay. So yeah, actually uh, we have a uh, local bodies, 753 local bodies. So each local bodies is given the right to make own curriculum for the school. So uh, there are some organizations which are working to integrate a climate curriculum all over Nepal, but not but there is no any organization which is trying to integrate indigenous food system and sustainable food system, organic food system uh, uh, in the school curriculum. So I think maybe we can integrate that in the school curriculum uh, in various uh, local levels. And in this way, we can uh, uh, aware more and more use uh, children and, uh, and create a sustainable food system. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a very rich discussion on the policy priorities. Do you have anything add, to add, Michelle, before I hand over? So, yeah? No. <laughs> no, I just want to say that there are national delegations here from the different countries as well. So I just wanted to them to also see if they have anything to add. You guys have prepared statements as well. So I don't know if you want to read out some parts that are relevant for this or... Otherwise, these are also available online for us to read, which also captures like the views of like their views in their food systems in their local areas. 
um, this is not necessarily in our school because our school is an international school, but we do have a nutrition like thing as a course in Korean public schools. Honestly, um, I think he mentioned it before, but for us as students, learning it through books is also good, but learning through experience is better for us, especially mm. if, if it's um, in regards to the food system. So um, maybe um, in our school, particularly, if we in the cafeteria, we get all the nutrition information about the foods we are eating. I think that's a good way to implement it in our daily basis, not learning directly from the books. So, yeah. Very practical and simple solution to have like nutrition data on what's being served in, in cafeterias. I think that helps a lot. Yes, make it quick, Quan. Thank you very yes, much. Jay. Thanks. And it's very quick. Uh, it's about uh, Jay was talking about the certification, but really I issue because it's very expensive for us. And we have a guarantee that systems we when the farmers an association and they build their own certification and embracing the guidance of the laws of the organic production. So this is a way that they can have certifications and more chips and in that way at value of their products. Thanks. Thank you very much certifications uh nutrition data and all these thank you uh this is a very rich uh, discussion on each of the five priorities and now we are actually on time uh we are about to wrap up already uh with that we'd like i'd like to uh, invite our uh the deputy permanent representative from the philippines to give a reaction on the general process on the policies basically Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, maybe just to uh, give a little closing, since I'm the only, I think, the member state representative here. Um, the the committee on food security was just held last week, and the member states have endorsed uh, the youth. Um, uh, the policy recommendations for youth engagement uh, in agriculture and food systems. Um, so uh, the Philippines, and I guess uh, also the, the members who have endorsed these recommendations, recognize the youth as agents of revolutionary change. Given your dynamism, your innovative innovativeness, technology savviness, and uh, overflowing desire to make an impact in communities worldwide. So hopefully these recommendations, this uh, youth po uh, recommend policy recommendations for youth engagement in agriculture uh, would help promote a cultural shift uh, in perspective regarding agriculture and food systems and would facilitate youth engagement uh, in agri-food systems transformation for food security, resilience, and nutrition and help empower you to also empower others, you know, uplift the capacities of family farmers, indigenous peoples, and other stakeholders uh, boost uh, farm productivity. And uh, we appreciate all the efforts of the youth to input uh, into uh, what has to be done um, by policymakers uh, in, in this space. So thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Joy, uh, for that. And uh, with that, uh, we've reached the end of the regional roundtable. Um, you have the QR code. Could you please flash the QR code again? Um, for those who still want to go and go over the document, give their inputs, uh, suggestions, and all these, please, you can scan the QR code and we'd love to get your inputs as well. We'll be here throughout the week. You want to grab us, uh, give us some links or references. We'd be happy to take that into consideration as well. So thank you very much. Again, uh, we have other roundtables coming up throughout the week. Uh, Africa will be coming up in, at 12 o'clock in the same room. So see you around and thank you very much.